Hey, welcome ladies and gentlemen, gamer boys and gamer girls, welcome back to the escape pod. Spring is here, nature is blooming, love is in the air and we are back at it again. Sadly, there were no surprises this month, all the games were revealed weeks ago. And we were kinda saddened by this fact. Anyhow, as usual we put 3-4 to four hours into each game, more if it is needed, and also we have tweaked a bit on the scoring system. And if you allow me one more comment before starting, thank you very much for all the feedback on last month's video. Really appreciate your help. Alright, here comes what you all are waiting for. Let the reviews roll! At its core, Ageless is a charming puzzle-slash-precision platformer starring Kiara, a young girl suffering from way too early midlife crisis. Due to feeling life is aimless, she heads out in search of a mysterious gate that hands out gifts, hoping that through that she would gain purpose. This is then spiced with a random bloke being a douche, not telling her the gate is five steps to the right, then inviting her to his hometown and later down the line being an ass to her once again for not killing an entire biome just to save his sister. All of this based on the relationship of maybe four minutes of talking. What I'm trying to get at here is, the story is a rushed mess. In exchange, the game offers an interesting core mechanic revolving around aging back and forth all the plants and animals in your path, which results in differing interactions. For example, a baby rhino is easy to lure to when you'd want him to be, age him a bit and he becomes a wrecking ball attacking you on sight, push him further to grandpa age and he'll be fat enough to break floor with his weight. It's neat, but pacing feels a bit off, I believe shortening each biome just a tad bit would have gone a long way to combat the slight boredom that kept crawling in at around the end of each. Visuals, while not bad, could have definitely used a bit more detailing, but to compensate, music is mostly good at the very least, now and then jumping to great, almost achieving the level of that in Ori. As for the puzzles, they're a mixed bag. As long as you follow the main road, the required puzzles range between easy and pleasant, but you are welcomed by the game to explore the many side rooms that contain a collectible each, locked behind more tougher brain teasers or platformer sections. Now as long as the obstacle is a brain teaser, you should be all good, and many of the platform challenges are also fair, but within the forest biome, you'll come across water-related sections, and that's where shit hits the fence. On one hand, I feel you drown way too fast, and that's after the devs apparently nerfing the mechanic last December. Beyond that, hazards blend in too much, and last but not least, there's the case of the insanity causing orcas. These fellas are one of the interactables that you can age back and forth. In their third state, you're supposed to be able to grab onto them like dolphins and swim faster or upstream. Well, apparently, only if he wants to do so as well. You can be legit standing on them, bashing your button without any response whatsoever until it randomly decides, now's the time to swim. The first 10 times maybe, you're like, okay, shit happens. But after 50 occasions, you'll start going insane. Especially if 20 of that 50 is during chase sections. It's worth noting that if you actually push through the forest biome, the game gets a lot better, question being how many will find it worthwhile to do so. You can occasionally come across similar phenomena elsewhere as well. From time to time, the same input sequence will have different results when attempting to interact with your environment. On a completely separate note, I'm pretty sure Ageless is the first paid title I've ever seen that doesn't have its own shortcut slash taskbar icon, but instead just uses Unity's. Anywho, summing up everything, do I think Ageless is a horrid experience? No, not really. The music and simplistic charm goes a long way in carrying this title, and pretty often you'll come across sections where you'll get to see for a few seconds the slick, fun, well-oiled interactive gameplay I imagine was the aim from the developers, but still, there's just nothing outstanding to compensate the annoyances and make you want to pick this title over the many other really fun and interesting games out there. I rate Ageless, I wish it was properly polished, out of 10, 
and we'll leave you with the freshly uncovered sex tape of two unknown arcade machines. Elix. When I first looked at the game, I was pleasantly surprised. Wow, another RPG from the creators of the Gothic series I adored so much during my youth. A planet after an apocalyptic event that put the whole world back in 200 years? Sign me up! So Elix is the post-apocalyptic story of the planet Megalan, which was hit by a comet and brought not only mass destruction for its civilization, but also a mysterious and extremely powerful resource called Elix. Hence the name. After the dust settled, three factions emerged. The Berserkers, who are rejecting modern technology but using magic. The Outlaws, who are greedy, I'd stab my puppy in the face for some money kind of people. And the Clerics, who are worshipping the god Kalan and love technology. So these are the three people fighting for resources and power, but there's a fourth faction, the Albs. The Albs are ex-clerics who started to consume Elix, which made them strong and stripped them from any emotions and pigmentation. The protagonist Jax was an ex alp commander who messed up his mission, so he was shot and left to die by his people as a punishment for failure. So let's talk about what it's like to play the game. The world is huge and interesting, and you will see lush forests, deserts and snowy mountains. The graphics are okay, isn't very much of a looker, but it can shine sometimes. You can feel the gothic vibes in here for sure. Meaning all the bad and all the good. You can see all the good things gothic brought into the RPG world. All the NPCs are living their lives. They are waking up, they go out to work, they talk to each other, they sleep during the night. You can pickpocket anybody, you can break into anywhere, etc. The writing is okay, the voice acting for me was a bit mediocre, but, but hey, at least there is voice acting. So we have a great setup, huge area to play in, great NPCs, four factions who hate each other, different endings naturally, crafting and freedom. Sadly Elix is as gothic like as it can be, meaning it isn't fully polished. The difficulty level is static, meaning it isn't dynamic like in the Fallout series. Every enemy's level is set and won't change, meaning eventually you will one-shot everybody and the game will get easier the more equipped and higher level you are. And the same applies in the early game. You will get killed by everything in the beginning. The combat is, well, <laughs> unique. I've seen people describe this as Souls-like, but I really hate it when they use this term whenever you have more than two moves and you have to dodge roll. You can also use fast but weak attacks and hard-hitting slow attacks. You can dodge roll and block and that's it. It felt a bit janky to me, but that is my subjective opinion. The missions are interesting enough to read through them, but aren't captivating enough. The way I play open world RPGs is the following. I come out from the starting area and I explore. If I stumble upon a quest, I pick it up and I move through, killing, looting, exploring. And these things work like charm. I love to stumble upon hidden stashes or left behind letters. The combat, as mentioned, isn't the best. It allowed me to enjoy the hunt though. There are some bugs and I softlock my game once somehow and no NPCs were able to talk to me, so I had to reload an early I'll save, which is never a good sign. But I just remembered what was gothic like and I wasn't mad anymore. More like nostalgic. Overall, I want to make myself clear. Despite of all the criticism of certain parts of the game, it is still a great game. I wouldn't be playing this still if it wasn't good. And I give credit where credit is due, but I will criticize every part that is problematic. So, Elix is a fun game and enjoyable, but it won't change your life. Why did you leave the crash site? Survival Protocol 7. Commander presumed dead. U4 unit attempted return to repair station. Hotshot Racing is an arcade racing game assumedly aiming to deliver the atmosphere of 90s arcade gaming spaces to your living room. Should you spend a few minutes browsing the options menu, a few pleasant surprises might greet you, such as preset audio slider settings, 
tuned to deliver best sound effects, music or environmental sounds, or the option to set your controller's vibration strength, which I'm actually not sure I've ever seen before, yet I'm sure I've wished for in the past. There's also a decent variety of game modes available. You can tackle Grand Prix, jump in for a single race, or try one of the wackier race types. In Barrel Barrage, you're not allowed to drop below a certain speed. In Drive or Explode, you can blow up opposing racers with explosive barrels. Or in Cops and Robbers, you can emulate Need for Speed's Hot Pursuit mode by starting out as a racer and once you're caught, you'll join the police force. Sadly, that sort of concludes our list of pros going for hot shot racing, and this list gets heavily outweighed by the cons. Starting off, there's no tutorial. Any game mechanic is presented to you via loading screen pop-ups, which you either get to read randomly or you don't. Obviously, we're not talking about any insanely deep mechanics, just your run-of-the-mill slipstreaming, drifting, perfectly timed starts and nitro, but believe it or not, not everyone has already played arcade racers, if this was someone's first entry to the genre, they'd certainly have no idea what's going on. Point number two is difficulty. Normal and hard modes are almost the same, both being way too easy to beat, and then you jump into expert mode, which pummels you into the ground. First of all, the point of having difficulty levels would be giving the player opportunities to gradually get better, emphasis being gradually, and the choice of either being bored or pummeled definitely doesn't serve this goal. Secondly, I'm fairly certain the AI races with overtuned cars. Even with the fast car type, I was having difficulty catching up to the drifter car type, which is supposedly the slowest. Speaking of which, there are four types of cars to choose from. The fast one, the drifty one, the one with good acceleration and the balanced one. From my experience, the balanced one and the accelerator one are completely useless, and even the drifty one is niche, to say the least, so I feel there's an issue with balancing these as well. Moving on, we get to the biggest fault of hot shot racing, reward, and this comes in two distinct areas. Firstly, to my understanding, the point of a racing game is to be the best of the competition, Mastering the tracks, shaving off milliseconds via learning perfect curves, knowing how to drive your car, these all lead you to being in pole position and winning. We're not in hot shot, here, if you're in first position, you're doing something wrong, simply because there's absolutely no reason to be there throughout the race, except for the very last second, crossing the finish line. All of this is thanks to the slipstream mechanic implemented. If you're not familiar with what this is, simply put, driving in the shadow of another car allows you to gain additional speed due to your car having to fight less resistance, thus you gain on them and eventually overtake them. This is implemented in almost every racing game, but in Hot Shot, this is almost literally everything. You'll get a massive boost to your speed. I've managed to keep up with racers blowing nitro tanks by just staying behind them. And further to this speed boost, you'll also keep gaining nitro from it to add salt to injury. On the other hand, if you're in pole position, not only will you keep giving the others slipstream, unless you choose to constantly drive off curve of course, but then you'll lose time, you'll lose your position, and also you'll be starved of nitro as well, as the only other option to get some is by drifting, which is something that slows you down naturally. Thus me saying, you're actually not being rewarded for playing better than others, but punished and instead second best gets massively rewarded. Case in point number two, crashes. Similar story here, usually the better driver doesn't crash into other racers, because they understand how much they lose by doing so, we're not here, the one punished during a crash is not the offender, but the victim, being knocked the fuck off track, while the one crashing into them just goes on happily with their life. This is all spiced with graphics that I didn't find too appealing, although not bad, they just don't really deliver anything, voice lines and forced background story snippets that are completely out of place. I wish he could have seen me then, standing in front of the cheering crowds, but he wasn't there. It was my dream, not his. And when it ended, I went back. To the garage where it all began. 
I hoped that he'd be proud of me. And you know what? He was. And a completely non-existent player base. And when I say non-existent player base, I mean the Texas ghost town with tumbleweed and shit type. I checked back numerous times to join a lobby. After getting bored of that, I tried hosting a lobby that was completely ignored for 30 minutes. So I checked Steam charts and at the time of recording, on an average weeknight, there were 47 players in the game. Apparently, all the other 46 players were just racing AI. All that being said, I still don't think Hotshot Racing could be categorized as garbage. It delivers great on the arcade vibe, it has great moments of speeding through the tracks, so unlike many games it does actually have something going for it, but nonetheless, other than firing it up for an hour or two of casual fun, you're absolutely safe steering clear. I rate this game Ghost Town out of 10. Boreal Blade. <sighs> this is the kind of review I hoped I will never encounter. See guys, most of the time we are putting 3 to 4 hours into each game so we can give you a nice review of the product. We strongly believe if 3 to 4 hours aren't enough, a few more can help to unveil everything about the game. And so far it went great, but then along comes Boreal Blade. I have put the same amount of hours into this game, and as of the recording of this, I've tried three more times in three different time of the day, just to see what it's really like. Well, we are releasing this video tomorrow, and as of now I can't really talk about this game. The reason behind is plain and simple. No one plays this game. And apart from the tutorial, this game is only multiplayer. After completing the tutorial, I tried to join games, there were none. Okay, I thought maybe the servers are down, so I created one. I waited around 20-30 minutes in my lobby, no one shows. Okay, then I thought maybe the servers are indeed down, so I went to test other games and came back a few hours later. I tried again, nothing. So I opened the Steam charts, and what I saw was shocking. The average player number for this week is 3.1. I quickly calculated my chances, they were grim, but I didn't give up. After a couple of more tries and several hours in the warm-up lobby, I could finally see the light. Someone was looking for a duel. God, my heart raced. Finally, finally, I can get some experience I can talk about. I click join. I have connected. And then... I was disconnected instantly. And all my high hopes died. I really hoped for some nice fun. Maybe to see a contender to Morto. Well, this game died before birth. It's still in early access. There's no hype around it. And barely anyone plays it. Don't pick this game. Only if you have friends to play with it, because you likely won't be playing with this with randoms. As for the scoring, for me, it can't be rated, as this game was a no-show. Peaky Blinders Mastermind is a puzzle adventure game based on the popular TV series running under the same name. I said it's a puzzle adventure game, as that's where the community likes to place it, but in reality, there's not much adventuring to do, you walk down predetermined routes with occasional dialogues and mid-level stories. Let's just call it a puzzle game. You might remember, a few months back, Iron Danger was an offer. Well, if you checked that title out and liked it, you're going to be fond of Peaky as well. Core concept, just like in ID, is playing with the timeline. As you play through the surprisingly limited number of levels, you'll be tasked to navigate a set number of obstacles to get to the end via switching between the characters that usually play distinct roles in solving the puzzles. For example, one of them can order NPCs around to do their bidding, another one can divert attention so the team can sneak past, others can beat enemies up and so on and so forth. 
I wouldn't go as far as to say it's all reasonable. For example, there's only this one specific lead that is capable of throwing an oil lamp at debris to light it on fire. Only a certain pair can beat people up, despite others being just as sizable buff dudes, and so on. But hey, if you can just accept this is how things are for the sake of the puzzles, and treat them as jigsaw pieces instead of fictional characters, you'll have a fun time. And I truly mean you will actually have a fun time. You'll go into levels, knowing close to nothing due to objectives being as vague as find a way to, talk to, get out of, and so on. So you walk around the environment, discovering the interaction points, and mentally piecing together the interaction pairs. Oh, I have this guy on my roster that I know can interact with these things, I should bring him here. As soon as you feel you're onto something, you're free to wind back time and guide your puppet to the interaction point. Most likely though, on his or her way there, there's gonna be another obstacle that this one won't be able to tackle. You'll once again start thinking which dude to use to progress, wind back time and bring them over as well. Twist being, all previous actions you have taken are remembered, and if you previously walked down an alley with the green dude, you'll walk down there again as you restart time. Meanwhile, you can go up the roof of a garage with purple girl, so she can lower down a chain bridge for green dude to pass through. But maybe, garage is locked, so you'll also need to simultaneously climb through the window and unlock from the inside with red kid. I could keep going forever, but you get what I'm trying to get at. The important thing is, once you've found all the solutions and move your last piece, it's really satisfying to know in the back of your mind how you've masterminded your small team through the chaos of Birmingham. As I mentioned earlier, there's a shockingly low number of playable levels, 10 in total. To put this in perspective, three and a half hours in, I'm currently on level 8, so even though, if I'm not mistaken, level 10 is supposedly a grand finale, I don't expect the game to last more than 5-6 hour stops. If you're interested in that sort of thing, you can go back to collect all the pocket watches and get the gold time score, but to be fair, those are things you could already do during your very first playthrough. The story is nothing noteworthy, it's just some forgettable fluff to connect the puzzles together. Visuals are also not anything outstanding really, they're serviceable, but they're just there. But music is actually great, even if you decide not to check out this title, I'd recommend at least giving the OST a listen, it's actually that good. All in all, I'm a bit sad about the game length, I really find the gameplay fun and relaxing, but despite that shortcoming, I'd be more than happy to recommend Peaky to anyone, I rate this, wish there was more out of 10. Control. Control is one of the big hitters in this bundle. It is a third-person action game with RPG elements, featuring a female protagonist, Jessie. The game starts off by an immediate stress, meaning you, the player, won't have a clue about anything and anybody, and the game puts you right in the middle of the story. It is really hard not to talk about this game in length, so I will try to keep it short and informative as a humble review should be, okay? The game is not for everybody. <laughs> I guess you didn't see this coming, huh? Let me elaborate. The game starts slow, and for a while, you will be lost. In my opinion, the writers did a really good job with this, and the slow pace keeps the game mysterious in the first couple of hours. You, the protagonist, come in the front door just to arrive into an office that is completely empty, and the only person you meet is the janitor, who is a damn good NPC and is as mysterious as the whole place. He wishes you good luck for getting the job and lets you go. When you get to the end of the corridor, just to find the elevator, you realize this is exactly where you came in, but you are now coming out from that very same corridor without turning back and the elevator wasn't here before. This was the very moment I fell for this game and I was playing it for only 20 minutes. The whole office oozes mysteriousness. You can feel that this place is watching you, like a sentient being. 
So after you come out the elevator, you go into the director's office, where you can see the director's body in a blood pool. It's suicide. And when Jesse picks up the gun, everything changes. You become the ruler of this place. You become director. And as you walk out from your office, you are instantly attacked. You fend off the attackers just to realize all the pictures and paintings, which a second ago showed the recent director's face, changed into yours. It doesn't take you too long when you finally meet the first survivors and you begin to unfold this whole mess. The game was written by Sam Lake, who wrote the Max Payne series and Alan Wake, and he did a terrific job in this game. All the documents, stories, phone calls, NPCs, TV shows, documentaries you can find in this game are top-notch work. But you have to read and listen and watch these medias to get the full picture about this place they call the Old House. See, the office is an object of power, that is, where the Federal Bureau of Control resides. The building shifts and changes itself. Rooms disappear, corridors open, even the building is hiding in plain sight and no one can see it, only if they intentionally looking for it. I felt like I'm in an SCP universe. I don't know if you know what the SCP universe is, but if you don't, definitely google it. It has a lot of similarities with this game. Soon enough, it turns out that the Bureau is under attack by the Hiss, that possesses the employees, and turns them into something else. It is creepy at first, and never starts being creepy, watching people levitate while murmuring. Literal chills down the spine. As mentioned, the NPCs are beautifully written. The character models are great, but I have to mention that sometimes the face animations get really weird and funny. The scenery is beautiful. Even so, if you have an RTX-capable graphics card, all the lights on the different surfaces as they reflect or shine through the windows are jaw-dropping. The combat is great, although it will become a bit repetitive later on when you have found your style of fighting, but it's a whole lot of fun. I have never realized I missed destructible scenery this much until I played this game. I was smiling while I tore down a whole building. Of course, as all the games from the recent years, Control also has skills and EXP and different weapons and powers. I won't go into details and I don't want to tell any spoilers, but as I mentioned, there are objects of power and, well, you can harness them powers. A whole lot of them, actually. Although the whole game plays in one office, it is a huge area to explore, and I really like the 1960s style. The reason I've said this game is not for everybody, because the game doesn't reveal all that much to the player by itself. I love to read lore, and grind for things, but someone who doesn't care about these things will have a different opinion about this game. The side missions are interesting, but require a lot of backtracking. The story is good, but only if you are willing to put the time and effort to read through all the documents and listen to the voice recordings. The enemies have a number of variations, but they aren't too smart. You can't level up only by finishing missions, meaning you either have to grind through everything, or you miss out half the fun. The music is okay, it keeps you pumped during combat, but it isn't as good as in Doom. Overall, this game is a must-pick if you like mysteries, if you like to crush enemies with slabs of concrete, or you like a strong female protagonist. No matter what they told me all those years, I know it's real now. I didn't imagine this. I want to be a part of this world. Wildfire is a 2D stealth platformer that heavily reminds me of my favorite stealth game ever, Mark of the Ninja. Your aim is to progress from one end of each level to the other, ideally unnoticed via hiding in bushes, coffins, under bridges and so on, figuring out enemy patrol routes to note blind spots, or distracting enemies. First thing you'll note is the beautiful pixel art this game uses. You can notice the care and attention that went into the details, of bushes nestling as you go through, lighting effects as things catch on fire, basically all around. I feel similar about the sounds and music, it all blends into a satisfying, coherent whole. There's one area that I couldn't praise as the previous ones, that would be the story. So far, it's about a meteor landing near a tribe, at the same time these Brunhilda soldiers decide it's reasonable to enslave all of them and burn their village, 
and our protagonist starts awakening elemental powers likely linked to the meteor crash. Summary, it's forgettable. Speaking of powers though, the twist the game introduces to the core stealth concept is granting you elementalist spells to toy with. You'll start out only able to grab and throw fire, but your arsenal expands either through the story progression, gaining access to other elements, or collecting resources, which are rewarded for completing side objectives, saving others, remaining undetected, and so on and so forth. These resources you can then spend in a talent tree-like system that offers both passive power-ups, like increasing your range, allowing you to hold your breath underwater longer, or active abilities, such as creating bubbles to fly around in, or smoke screens. Another neat thing is, upon unlocking a new feature, before entering the next level, you'll be dropped into a mini-tutorial on the ability you just unlocked, which, albeit not always necessary, it is a welcome gesture. Level design is great, even beyond the graphics, there are always multiple routes to succeed, just playing through the first few levels, you'll come across a nice variety beyond your basic stealth past enemies routine, you'll have to escort, race time, play controlling a different character, and this is just to name a few. Beyond this, as mentioned earlier, you'll be presented with optional objectives to complete, and speedrun timers to beat, and even better, these are all available from the get-go, the game doesn't force you to play levels millions of times over, drip-feeding you the objectives one by one. Difficulty and progression speed are both right on spot, with that being said I have to admit I haven't progressed too far out yet, during the three and a half hours of playtime I have in, I only reached level 10, but that's because I kept going back to previous levels, to collect everything, save everyone, try different approaches, and at the end of the day, I think, that is the real sign of a great game, when instead of trying to rush through, you keep going back just for the sake of it. Needless to say, I have no other option but to rate this game almost as good as Mark of the Ninja out of 21. Cyberhook. Have you ever wondered what it's like to use a grappling hook and parkour your way through different obstacles while maintaining a solid speed of 200 km per hour? Well, this is your game. If you like the 80s retro style, if you like the game speedrunners, then Cyberhook is your game to play. I had a massive blast with this one. The mechanics are easy to learn but hard to master. I had to retry almost every stage at least 3 to 4 times just to get the best results, but I didn't feel it even for one moment jarring. I haven't had this much fun with a game like this since forever. The graphics are okay, nothing too special, but I really like the neon style of the game. The game also has some kind of a story, but to be honest it is forgettable. All I could think about was how to solve the next stage, and how good Tarzan's life could have been back in the day. As the title suggests, you will have a cyberhook in hand that you will use to traverse through terrain, also you will have a time warp ability so you can slow down time for a short period, and yeah, you can shoot, so you can destroy some obstacles in the way. I know this isn't sound too much, but it's a great game to play, it's an absolute blast. All the gameplay mechanics are fleshed out, everything works as intended. The music is awesome and really complements the high speed obstacle courses. Most of the time I realized I am giving out sounds while playing, and I'm actually not ashamed by the fact. If you want to know what kind of feelings the game generates, well, here you go. God, finally!
did it. Woohoo! <laughs> Overall, it is such a great game. It is simple, but achieves what it set out to itself. In my opinion, you should absolutely pick it. Kingdom Two Crowns Kingdom Two Crowns is a post-release rework of Kingdom Classic, filled with new game modes and co-op. If you look at the spine of the game, it is a 2D side-scrolling strategy game set in the feudal European times, but if you choose to play Kingdom Shogun, which is included in the game, you can venture to feudal Japan and try to build your kingdom among the bamboo forests. Although the game isn't looking like a deep strategy game, the looks can't be more deceiving. Trying to win in this game is a hard journey. The game starts out with you, the ruler, a couple of gold coins in your pocket, and an encampment. From here you must build an army, get some peasants who will work for you, set up a smithy to recruit builders to set up defenses, and so on and so forth. Although the game is in 2D, defending is hard since you will have to make sure that both ends of your kingdom is safe and sound, because you can only be present at one side and you can only see 
one from the two sides at the same time. Time management is also very essential, as if your builders isn't finished with the work outside of the encampment, monsters will come out during the night and they are looting, killing and demolishing everything in their ways. So make sure everyone is behind walls when the night comes. The music and the sounds are top tier work. They complement the scenery and really makes you feel you went back in time. The graphics are beautifully done and as a huge fan of pixel art, this hit home. My only problem with this game is that you can't prioritize buildings and the workers will start to work on those buildings that are closer to them or the ones you place last. Apart from this tiny problem, I can suggest this game with good heart. Good news everyone! All those that felt their lives wasting away minute by minute while being forced to play Valkyria 4 instead of a random, godly XCOM title have had their prayers heard. Chimera Squad is an isometric, turn-based tactics game and it's the latest entry from the close to 30 years old XCOM franchise, as you would guess. You'll be tasked with taking control of the namesake Chimera Squad which is pretty much a SWAT team brought into City 31, where you'll conduct investigation into a mysterious crime syndicate, while at the same time attempting to do the local police force a favour or two. This leads us on to the first two differences between Chimera and its predecessors. Number one being, gone is the time of soulless puppets, members of the squad now actually have some resemblance of personality, bickering or joking between themselves, which is definitely a welcome addition, and number two, streamlined gameplay. While in previous entries you were supposed to manage a world map, building a base, all the missions popping and many other aspects, this time around, at the very least, base building is stripped, your HQ comes with necessary development areas, unlocked pretty much from the start. I for one definitely welcome this change, and actually wouldn't mind some more improvement on this front. For example, inventory management of squad members is still but annoying busy work, having to go in to strip and equip items you want to exchange between missions is pain incarnate. Also, as you'll be controlling but a single squad, rather soon you'll have agents on the bench. Whilst it's great that you have tasks that you can assign them to, like assisting research, going out to gather resources and so on, for some reason, even though these are important things to do, they don't award any experience, which then in exchange pretty much forces you down a path of using the same guys in the attack team as they'll be the ones leveled up, and leaving others behind pushing papers over and over again, limiting the fun of toying around with setups. This is pretty much why I said last month, the system in Valkyria 4, where your whole team levels up together based on gathered XP, is superior in my view. This is probably a good time to note also, that while I enjoy the aesthetic and small details of the HQ area, the UI could do with some revision, as it often felt clusterfuck-esque. Once you're done fiddling around with your backbone, you'll get to take your pick from the mission table, which pretty much is equivalent to the world map previously. As time passes, districts will need your help, but you'll only ever get to pick one location a day, leaving others to fall deeper and deeper into despair, a fun game of balancing whether you want to go for the fat loot mission with the ward, or rather, to the district that is about to go up in flames. Not all missions require your tactical genius though, Every other day, you'll be picking from so-called situations, where you just pick a scenario, get some result text and your currency reward. On your active days, however, once you select your mission, you'll head straight into the revamped combat system of Chimera. Instead of being dropped on a map to find enemies, you'll come across a set number of encounters. Imagine this as being a sequence of fights one after another, all starting with the new breach system. Before the action starts, you'll often have the choice to pick from different entry points that all lead to the upcoming fight, dependent on given map and your squad's setup. If, for example, you have C4 on you, you might be able to blow open new doors on walls, surprising your enemy. With keycards, you can unlock doors that would otherwise be inaccessible. Maybe you'll be able to slither through vents and so on, 
or if you've invested in none of this, you'll be left with the front door, which is usually pretty bad as you'll be expected to arrive from there, and not only will you not be able to benefit from the usually positive passive bonuses of alternate routes, but you'll often come to meet aggressive labeled enemies. This aggressive alert surprise trio is linked with the breach concept. If you manage to catch everyone surprised, you'll basically benefit from a free round of shooting before the fight can even start. On the other hand of the spectrum, aggressive enemies will be more than happy to shoot back at you. I actually really enjoyed this new approach to the tactical map gameplay, as I never really liked walking round and round the side areas, trying to spot every single enemy before engaging in previous titles, here you're instantly part of the action. Unfortunately, the shitty percentage based shooting system is still present, leaving you completely missing shots on enemies crouching two steps in front of you with their back shown, which is not only immersion breaking, but just a shitty system in general, and the game doesn't do the best job of explaining core concepts to new players either, such as how to determine if you'll be in line of sight after movement, how cover works, etc. Or ability descriptions can also leave room for wanting from time to time. I do think, however, the breach system, the fast-paced gameplay, the variety that having aliens on your team with their weird abilities adds, and the overall atmosphere of the game heavily outweighs the cons I've lined up, and, unless you're a hardcore Iron Man mode fan of previous titles, this game will offer a fun experience. Rating, variety is fun. Pastor Quest. Look, I have to be honest with you guys. Before this game I have only played Hive Swap, and I have never ever touched on the Homestuck series. All the knowledge I have about it is what I have read in two hours to get some information about this project. Therefore, sec, I'm putting this warning sign in here for any hardcore fans. So, this review is a subjective review, it is only my opinion and I'm aware of the fact that this Homestack universe has some pretty great numbers of hardcore fans. So now that we cleared the air and set the tone, let's talk about the game. This game is a visual novel, meaning you will be mostly reading by clicking next and occasionally, usually twice per chapter, you get to choose from two options what to do. The game is about you, the player slash reader, who after reading the last pages of the Homestuck story, gets angry and wants to have more. So you end up in this universe after some mystical encounter of two figures. The art style of the game is coherent, the characters are nicely drawn, the music fits. On the writing side of things, I don't know, it didn't fit me very well. A couple of young kids swearing all over the place and generally I didn't find it greatly written. During my playthrough I've seen a lot of dumb and completely unnecessary lines and inner monologues that didn't add to the story at all. Some of the characters were bland, or the plot was completely uninteresting. Again, I won't pretend I know everything about these characters, because frankly, I don't. But the way they were presented clearly shows that this game was meant for fans, hardcore fans to be exact, who know all the lore and all the tiny character traits there is to them. And since I'm not a fan, I just assume I don't get most of the references and happenings. Still, from my point of view, the game suffers a lot. I can't say I was particularly enjoying my time with this one. I know I wasn't really nice about the last visual novel I have reviewed, which was the second installment of the Vampire the Masquerade visual novels, but even that was better by a long shot. You could actually make decisions, immerse yourself at least a bit in that story. Sadly not in this one. Overall, I won't recommend this game to anyone who isn't into the Homestuck universe. Although I have spent time to read some of it, I still couldn't enjoy this game. Maybe if I were a long-time follower or a hardcore fan. Maybe. For all the fans out there, I'm guessing you will have some lovely time with it. So you may pick this one. So how's the bang you get for your buck this time around? Starting with the bad news, we received a handful of titles that are strongly recommended or can actually only be played multiplayer, 
but they have no player base. Luckily, we also received a pair of heavy hitting AAA entries, and further to those, you'll find a visual novel, a pair of platformers, an RPG, a strategy and a puzzle game, and an adrenaline pumping Cyber Ninja Training Ground Simulator. Before I get to sorting, allow me to mention a slight change in our scoring system. We've added an additional category. This is where we'll slot any title that has one or more game-breaking flaws, such as performance issues as heavy as making the game unplayable, or as an actual example and spoiler, Boreal Blade this time around, that is mostly unplayable due to the lack of players. We'll keep the free tier system beyond this slot, the best games of given month that we can wholeheartedly recommend, earn free points, games that undeniably have their moments but still feel average or just didn't float our boat will be granted 2 points, and the bottom of the barrel, which we recommend you don't waste time on, will only be awarded a single point. So for March, top end of the package in our opinion was Control, Cyberhook, Peaky Blinders, XCOM and Wildfire. Low tier entries were Hotshot Racing, WWE 2K and Pesta Quest, leaving Ageless, Elix and Kingdom 2 crowns in the midfield. This sums up to a total of 24 points out of the maximum 36, thanks to the highs being really high and lows being really low. Here's hoping we'll get no dead multiplayer games next month. As always, we'd be grateful if you please the machine gods by liking our video. If you'd like to come along for next month's ride, don't hesitate to subscribe. Any and all recommendations are welcome in the comment section. And legend holds, even Glorious Rome in fact wasn't built in but one day. We know you're all getting way sick and tired of being trapped inside, but stay safe just a bit longer, and hopefully, not only will we see you again in April, but we'll also soon be able to return to a more outgoing lifestyle.